I love the thought that we are learning to pray better in our relationship with the Lord. It's such a great privilege to work on this with you. So before we get started here, I just want to check in with Wes. Where are you, Wes? You're right there. Okay, so tell me the truth. We put the phone number up. Did you get any texts at all? No. You got nothing? Don't say that. How many did you really get? Okay, he won't even admit to it. And you know, it's probably my fault, right? Because if I was younger and I really understood your generation, I wouldn't have put his phone number. Maybe I would have put his Instagram up there or maybe his Snap or what is that? Is it called Snap? I don't know. But I don't have that stuff, so I didn't do it. So that's all right. That's no problem. <laughs> I got you, Wesson. I got you. Let's go. Okay, you ready? <laughs> what did you say? Put that back up? Can you reverse that? Put that back up. There it is right there. Let's go, baby. <laughs> All right, we good? <laughs> no, man. If there's a grandfather purgatory, I think I'm headed there. Okay, you guys ready? Let's go. Today... We're going to give you the second installment in this idea of unleashing the power of prayer in your life, right? And so we started in 1 John chapter 5, that amazing promise that is real. It's given five times by our Lord in the upper room discourse. And it's right there, and this is the confidence, right? This is the, the, the freedom of speech which we have before him. And what is it? That if we ask him anything according to his will, he will hear us and he will give us our request. It's a promise. I believe it. You believe it. We just don't always know how to apply it in our lives. Because on this side of the pulpit is where we talk about praying for our circumstances, right? And, and we don't know God's will about Ryan's brain tumor, or about Jamie, or about my little baby Heidi. And so we went to Philippians chapter 4, which teaches us so powerfully how to pray for our circumstances, right? We're anxious for nothing. We say no to that stuff. But then we got the four horsemen, right? And so we open a line of communication with the Lord, supplication. We ask for help, for strength, for wisdom, for guidance, for the, the stuff that we need. And then we thank him, number three, in advance. Well, we thank him for the trial itself, and then we thank him in advance for the outcome of that trial. And by doing that, we are doing one of the greatest, most important things we could ever do as believers. We are aligning ourselves with the sovereign purposes of God in our lives. Amen? Amen. Okay, so we get there. And then what does he want us to do? Word number four, give me your requests. Give me your specific detailed request of how you would like to see this go down. Why? Well, one, he wants you to know that he knows what you really like. It's an amazingly gracious God we have. So tell me, Russell, what do you want to see? But we are caution ourselves, and we don't think that because he's commanded us to give us our specific requests that he is going to fix our circumstances. That's the big X, nay. Don't go there. Don't ever let anybody teach you that it's good to do that. God nowhere in the New Testament promises to fix our circumstances. He's not in that business, Right? Take him off the hook. Never impugn his character. Never think about him that way. He's never said he would do it, and he doesn't do it. Occasionally he does, and look at our circumstances. They're amazing, aren't they? But he's not in the business of fixing them to the way that we want them to be. Well, what is he in the business of doing? Pray that way in verse 6. Philippians 4, 6, the big four, and what follows is the peace of God. The amazing uncomprehended, it surpasses all comprehension that you and I can walk through our life in the midst of some of the most difficult trials we will ever experience, and we are somehow at peace. Well, it's because we did the four things above. And that peace is so powerful that it will guard, remember the word guard, it will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. We will not lose our heart, which means to lose courage. We will not give up. We will not falter. We will not fail. We will not stop 
bringing glory to God, even though this thing is so ridiculously hard. The peace of God will guard our heart. And secondly, it will guard our minds. And we will not make stupid, sinful, ridiculous, self-destructive decisions just because the pressure is so big. So we have the privilege of praying for our circumstances so that we can bring glory and honor to God by going through whatever he brings into our life in a way that brings glory and honor to his name. Say amen. Amen. And praise God. What an amazing God to give us that. Now, over there, we're supposed to talk about how to pray for God's will in our lives. And on the way to over there, I want you to notice what I'm doing. The New Testament teaches two different kinds of prayer requests. We just covered how we pray for our circumstances. There's a second kind of prayer request that he gives us in the New Testament. It's right there in 1 John 5, and it's called praying for the will of God in your life. Right? Question, how in the world am I supposed to do that when I don't know what God's will is for my life? Here's the answer. Write this down. God's will for our lives is explicitly revealed in every command and exhortation directed at a believer in the New Testament. Let's, let's say that again. It's right there. You want to know God's will for your life? You want to know how to pray 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 and, and tap into that amazing promise? Yeah, I do. But I don't know what God's will is. Yes, you do know what God's will is for your life. It's amazing. God's will for your life is explicitly revealed in every command and exhortation in the New Testament. Direct. Let me give you a couple examples. What's, one of the, what's the big command? What's the great commandment? Remember the, the Pharisees and the scribes, they got Jesus cornered over there in Matthew chapter 22, and they were going to test him. They wanted to ask him a question that was so hard that he couldn't answer left and he couldn't answer right. They were trying to discredit his claim to deity. And so they said, hey, how do you keep all the law? And Jesus said, you keep all the law by what? Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's the great commandment that we all know. That keeps all of the law. It's an amazing thing. So we know what? We know that is what? Oh, that's God's will for my life, isn't it? God's will for Russell Moore, every day that he gets up out of bed, is that he would love the Lord his God with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now I find that I, I, absolutely, I absolutely love that command. No command could give more life and more breath and more energy and more meaning to my life than that command right there. But you know what? I struggle with that. Remember there in 1 John chapter 2 where it says, do not love the things of the world, nor the things that are in the world, because they are not from the Father. And then he defines them as the lust of the flesh. Don't love the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes, don't love the, and, and the boastful pride of life. Do you realize that even as believers, we can give our hearts to the wrong stuff, and we don't do this, right? Yeah. Well, let's change it then. Let's change it from a command, and it will always be a command that we need to respond to and try our very best to follow, but let's change it from a command to a request, and it looks like this. Oh my goodness, here we go. Here we go. You are invited into the very throne room of God. Anytime you're struggling with what you're falling in love with, if it's not honoring to God, I need you to know he's waiting for you. This is the confidence that we have before him. See it? I'm before him. I'm, I'm, I'm before him. I'm in his throne room and I have this incredible confidence. What's my confidence? In myself? No. My confidence is in his promise. What's his promise? Russell, you ask me anything according to my will, I'll give it to you. Okay, Lord, let's go. I'm struggling with my affections. I'm worldly, man. I, 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 I'm not doing what I ought to be. I, I'm not, I'm not, I, not even what I'm doing. The passions of my heart are not for you the way they are supposed to be. And I know that's your will for my life, that I love you with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. So, Father, please help me love you with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Does that make sense? Is that, is that inviting to you? Is that incredible? There is this enormous package of spiritual power that is waiting to be unleashed in your life as you learn to believe that promise 
Ask me anything according to my will, and I will do it. And couple it with the promises that, I mean, the expressions of his will. Turn them into prayer requests. And you know what? He'll do it. You'll find that he will do it. You'll find that you are falling back in love with the creator of the universe. Why? Because God keeps his promises. Give me, I'll give you another example. Here's a, this is an imperative verb. This is a command. It's out of 1 Peter chapter 2. Long for the pure milk of the word. You know what? I, I love this thing. <laughs> I love this thing more than anything else in the world. I believe it is the inspired, inerrant word of God. It's authoritative for my life and my practice. And the closer my life gets to living what this thing teaches, the better my life gets. But the reality is there are times when this thing can feel dry to me. This thing can feel dead to me. This thing can get left on a shelf and never opened, never read, never studied, never prayed for weeks at a time. How can this possibly be true? The living Word of God can go flat on me. Does it ever go flat on you? Of course it does. We're human beings, and though we're redeemed, we still struggle. This is God's will for my life. This is God's will for our life, that we long for the pure milk of the Word. You know, in that text, it, the words right before what we've quoted there, it says, like a, like a newborn babe. Like a newborn babe longs for the pure milk. Long for the pure milk of the word. Like, like I, got, I had five kids and I got 20 grandkids. I know what it looks like when a little infant is longing for the pure milk of the word. My kids used to wake us up all night long. Why? Well, because Heidi. Heidi has the milk. I need milk. I got, how many times a day does a baby want to drink milk from its mother? Seven, maybe eight, maybe nine. And does the baby want anything else? Does the baby, does the baby want a pizza? Does the baby want In-N-Out Burger? Does the, it will later, but it doesn't now. It wants this one amazing, perfect, complete, entirely satisfying thing called the pure milk of the Word. What I am trying to invite you to, my friends, I am not telling you to long for the pure milk of the word. That'll be another message another day. I am inviting you to believe the promise in 1 John chapter 5 when he says, if you ask anything according to my will, I will hear you, and if I hear you, I will do it, which means you're right there in this next expression, Father, help me, help me to long for the pure milk of the word. Amen? Listen now, God is not a genie. We don't just rub him once and twice and three times. He pops out and we say, hey, make me long for the pure milk of the word you said you would. Jesus tells this parable in Luke chapter 18. And it's about a widow. And she's come to the judge to bring her case And her case is the right case, and she should get what she's asking for. But remember, he's an unrighteous judge. And uh, because of that, he doesn't doesn't rule. He doesn't rule in her favor. He apparently is very lazy, and he's unrighteous. And, and, And so the widow comes back what? Over and over and over and over again. Jesus leads in Luke 18, 1. He says, this is how I want you to pray. Don't lose heart when you pray. Don't quit praying. Don't stop asking. I want you to be, and then he tells the parable, I want you to be like the widow who came to the unrighteous judge. He wouldn't give her what she deserved. He wouldn't give her what she was requesting. And instead of her losing heart and not asking anymore and giving up and walking away, she came back over and over and over again until he gave her the request, not because he was righteous, he just got fed up with the the annoyance, right? This is one of the favorite prayers in my life. Because this is, this is the most important thing in my life. And if I stop longing for this, I'm on my way down. 
But I have to confess to you that one of the great joys of my life is the confidence in the promise in 1 John. There are days when I will pray this exact prayer request. Ten times. And not because like I have a, a little list and how many times can I pray today. I'll pray it because I sense that I'm not where I should be with the Word of God. And I don't want to, I don't want to be where I shouldn't be with the Word of God. I, I remember the days, right, when you're flat. You look at the book and you remember the days when it would light you up and it would fire you up and it would speak to you. And every seems like every word in there was just like straight from God. That's, that's how we, that's what we, that's what it's about. So I'm inviting you, I'm encouraging you, I'm pleading with you to try this. Now, Kelly mentioned some things. Let's talk about the growth edge in our life. The growth edge in our life. Where do you struggle? What, what's the thing that's, you know over there in Hebrews chapter 12, where it says, uh, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, that's all the people back in 11. And then he says this, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. <sighs> Come on. These two things, these encumbrances and these besetting sins. What's an encumbrance? An encumbrance is something that isn't necessarily sin. It just doesn't belong in your life if you're going to run. Like if you're going to go run, you take your jacket off, you take your boots off, you take that, and you get into your running clothes because you're going to go run. An encumbrance is anything in your life that would keep you from running for the glory of God. What, you got one, you got two, you got three. I got some. I watch too much TV. I mean, here I am, 65 years old, been saved all these many, many years. I still struggle wasting time at nighttime watching TV. And a zombie watching TV like an idiot. I'm watching less TV now. But I still watch too much TV. Is it sin to watch TV? Of course not. Is it stupid to watch too much TV? Of course it's stupid. Why would I? My sin. Then he says, my sin which so easily, what's it say, entangles me. So that's a pretty powerful image, isn't it? I'm trying to run. I'm trying to run my race for the glory of God. And all of a sudden, somebody entangles. I think that somebody is me. Somebody entangles me, and I hit the dirt. Why? Because I sinned. I committed an actual overt sin. And there we are. Boom. Now we're face down in the dirt. Where do we want to be? We want to be running. But what's the Holy Spirit going to be doing now? Is he going to be empowering us? Is he going to be proclaiming the things of Christ? Am I effectively loving my wife? Am I effectively moving through my world for the glory? No, man. I'm in the dirt. And now the Holy Spirit, and it's a wonderful ministry. I've grieved him. I've, 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 I've quenched him. And now he's going to come gently bring this stuff we were praying about. He's going to remind me that he already knows all about my sin and all about my frailty. He's going to invite me to do what David did and confess my sins. And I'm going to do that by the grace of God. And he's going to stand me up. He's going to brush me off. And he's going to say, okay, bud, we got enough of that now? Yes, Lord, I got enough of that now, thank you. And then I can run some more, Right? It's amazing. This is how it works, man. This is the reality of our life. And so how do we live our life? How do we accomplish this amazing thing? we got this series going, living the life. How, well, one way we live our life this way is we recognize there's two kinds of prayer requests. There's my circumstances over here. I got it. But what about this over here? What about that amazing promise? And we remember, we realize that I want you to try this. I really want you to try this. I want you to pick a couple of passages where you're commanded to do what you, what you don't do, right? One of your struggle areas. I want you to write them on three by five cards maybe, the verses, but I want you to write them as prayer requests. And I want you to begin to ask God regularly, like many, many times a day, based on the promise of 1 John 5. We're not making a wish. We're not expressing a wonderful sentiment. 
We're calling down on the promise of God. And I, I, I'll tell you something. If you're going to feel a tailwind. And that tailwind is going to be God answering your prayers for His will in your life. We good? All right. Don't go there now, but in the book, there's a whole section called supplication. And it's all the commands and exhortations in the New Testament. And so if you're like, well, which one should I pray? Go to the supplication section. Find the one that speaks the most to you. And then begin to pray it like the widow prayed. And hang on a little bit. And you're going to find God showing up in your life. And he's going to be giving you that extra little help. Along with your Bible study. Along with your accountability, along with great preaching, along with all the other great dynamics of spiritual growth, just grab this one called Pray in the Spirit for the Will of God and set it right there. Okay. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, you are so amazing. You are so loving, you are so gracious, you are so powerful, and you are so awesome. And Father, as your son, Jesus, as you, were, as you were leaving the disciples the next day, as you were preparing them for your crucifixion the very next day, five times you reassured them of this very promise. And we know now, we understand now why John, John lived it for the next 50 years of his life, going before you on a regular basis, asking for your will to come true in his life, your will being those commands and exhortations that you had given. We know, Father, why Paul prayed that way, always praying, Lord, for people's spiritual development, their spiritual growth. He hardly ever prayed for circumstances. These guys got it. They understood it. They knew how it worked. And, Father, I pray for my friends here at TMU, these amazing students. They're full of life. They're full of love. They're full of joy. They're full of the Holy Spirit. They love you, Father. Help them, Father, to experiment with this. Help them to try this out. Help them to test you in that sense to see if it's true. Father, help me to long for the pure milk of the Word. Father, help me to love you with all of my heart, my mind, my soul, and my strength. These are the things that I really want for my life. And as you do that, Father, may I set aside these, these entanglements, these besetting sins and these encumbrances. Help me to run. Help me to run with endurance the race that you have put in front of me as I fix my eyes on your Son and do everything in my power to bring glory and honor to your name. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. Love you, man. God bless you.